when they began to use these Scalar weapons, Aum Shinrikyo went on air. Shoko Asahara appeared on Japanese television and said, Japan will be attacked by my earthquakes. That's when he unleashed Tesla Scalar weapons and the Osaka earthquake left over a billion United States dollars in damage within a matter of a single minute. With his plans to kill the emperor and overthrow Japan, his proclamation of his ushering in a fourth age of Buddhism. Understand that most people misunderstand harp technology. They think that maybe it can be used to call, well, cause earthquakes. Well, it's extremely low frequency raves compared to scalar weaponry. It, well, elf waves, as they're called, they can be used for earth penetrating tomography, EPT. This allows prediction of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Sub subterranean surveying capabilities. That's something that can detect fault lines, but they cannot affect them. Nikolai Tesla developed a terrifying array of energy weapons a hundred years ago that could indeed cause earthquakes utilizing EMP, electromagnetic pulses. So because the Aum Shinrikyo had purchased such technology from the Russians, and the Americans knew about this because of their trying to purchase it from the Americans. They unleashed their weapons on Japan. The Holy Pope of Yomu, Asahara Shoko, announced in his radio broadcast that Japan will be attacked by an earthquake in 1995. Kobe, meaning Osaka Kobe. And that's when the earthquake struck. Fifth largest city in Japan, population over five and a half million, to hit, hit by one of the most destructive superquakes in Japanese history. Entire apartment blocks collapsed in seconds. The ancient capital city of Kyoto Shi was integrated in conurbation with Osaka, all severely damaged. 7,000 dead, 30,000 injured, 300,000 displaced, 100 billion United States dollars in damage was ultimately calculated in the aftermath. The Supreme Leader Asahara's attack had to be stopped, but the Japanese government couldn't officially stop him because that would throw the entire Japanese public into a panic. This was the second largest economy in the world. His next target was Tokyo by his own challenge. If he took down Tokyo, the entire world stock market would collapse. The economy of the world would crash. So they turned to the cult of Nichiren Buddhism. These were the cult of the Mapo Apocalypse, Soka Gakai, Value Creation Society. The lady who used to host Revolution Radio with myself, Noreen Helphan, was a member. They attacked the, Sobe, the Tokyo subway station, killing very few people, but framed the cult of Shoko Asahara, which then gave the Japanese government the excuse to close in on them. The Japanese government couldn't respond to shutting down the Aum Shinrikyo cult on the basis of earthquake technology because that would throw the stock market into a crash. But to show you the fact that the American government knew about it, when the Tokyo Towers collapsed, Colin Powell was the black general who was then serving as Secretary of State he immediately, he immediately froze all Shoko Asahara's Aum Shinrikyo assets in the United States. He froze them because he thought they had taken down the Twin Towers. 
That was the technology that they had. This is the influence of Japanese cults on the surface of the world today, battling each other in secret for your future, which you know nothing about. They were talking about Japan. I was there in 2015, and uh, there's something that uh, I still cannot understand. Uh, being there, it was very puzzling that uh, they managed to to mix the Shinto and the the, the corporation. Yes, as a concept. Uh, yes. which seems like a contradiction. How do you explain that? This is because they were able to syncre syncretize, blend both Buddhism and Shintoism in the past. This is what they do with Shintoism and corporatism. Understand that um, the Japanese will take the best of something, combine it, and make it work. To try and help explain this, the power that Japan has. Just recently, they've doubled in land size. 7,000 new islands have been added to Japan. Japan itself has four main islands, the largest, but there are 7,000 Japanese islands. Granted, a number of them are artificial, some of them built in the days of the samurai to house the Europeans on, so they would never step foot on Japan itself. Yet recently, overnight, Japan doubled with 7,000 new islands. This while the seas are rising and other island nations are sinking, Japan doubled in landmass. Don't take my word for it. Anybody can look this up. Look up 7,000 new islands discovered in Japan. It's true. It made the news. Nobody talks about it because they don't understand it. So understand this. The way that Shinto can integrate into corporatism is through Buddhism. The understanding that there is a Buddha in the robot. There is a book by that title written by a Japanese roboticist, a robot scientist, titled The Buddha in the Robot. This is because they understand that that which is created, it's the same as if you gave birth. If you give birth, you impart something of yourself into the child. When you make something, you impart something of yourself. So any robot created is human in essence. The Japanese understand this, which is why they imbue their products with a sense of soul and work with a sense of purpose. Their robotics factories would be considered the way we consider mass productive facilities for chickens or ducks or poultry we're producing or breeding on a mass scale. This is because of the ancient Shinto's concept of the kami. You've already heard the term kamikaze, the divine wind. Kami, God. Kami are spirits residing within a place or idea. Anything in the world or beyond it that can instill in human beings a sense of divinity, mystery, or awe is home to a kami. The peace one feels at the summit of a majestic mountain is the influence of the kami that lives there. The passions aroused at the banks of a raging river are also reflections of the kami that are present. The kami are not only manifestations of the physical world, but great ideas and beliefs, such as alternate religions or belief systems, also have a kami. When one feels a sense of awe and wonder, whether caused by the sight of a, a volcano in Hawaii, or a butterfly in Brazil, or a swell of patriotic pride at a national monument, then that person feels the touch of a related kami. In the presence of a kami, an adept with the appropriate abilities can make contact and even entreat the spirit for aid. The power of the kami depends on its location. Um, a small, beautiful stream would have a weak, mild water kami. But a great mountain would be home to a mighty earth kami. The power of the kami can change as the nature of the place or idea it inhabits changes. Thousands of years ago, the kami of computation was barely alive. 
the Mongols had killed it. It existed only on in the abacus or a few Greek astronomical instruments. Today, the computer spirit kami is vastly powerful with offspring and relatives in abundance. But how to translate this into what has just recently happened? You see, Shinto is the indigenous religion of Japan before Buddha brought the concept of Zen or the teachings of Confucius were adopted by the emperor, Shinto taught that everything in the world had a spirit called the kami, that the kami were divine, no matter how simple or mean their source, from stones on the ground to the mountains above, each contained a living soul that could be contacted, respected, and even entreated for service. So the rituals of honoring and communing with these spirits became the basis for the Shinto religion. And Shinto teaches man to honor nature in all its specific forms. And in this way, they also honor the specific kami connected to that form and gain their favor. In return, the kami helps man to succeed and prosper. The kami do not care what other beliefs man has. And so Shinto has existed harmoniously alongside every other religion and philosophy for over 5,000 years. Today, with the very, the very nation of Japan threatened by the Russo-Chinese, the Sino-Slavic Synaxis of Russia, China, North Korea, with missiles flying over the skies of Japan every day. The kami are taking action. When the very mountains can be crushed by nuclear fists, then those mountains must act. And the kami have called on their agents to do so. The Shinto priesthood and their young progeny. This is why practically overnight, 7,000 islands have arisen in Japan and it's doubled in landmass to 14,000 islands. But Anyone no can look people. this back. I'm sorry? But there's no people. There's a demographic catastrophe. Everyone is suffering this, including Japan's enemies. Everyone is suffering this crash, except for the black Africans and the Asian Indians. Maybe the people of certain areas of South America but mostly it's black Africa and Asian India where the population explosion is occurring. Even in Catholic Philippines, where the church has the influence of discouraging abortion, the population is declining. Mm -hmm. The problem this, with... Yes. I'm sorry, in this large scale picture that you painted, where would you position the Vatican? The Vatican this? fought on the side of the Axis in World War II. Understand that what we need to do for the future in order to rehabilitate civilization is we need to turn to Bulgaria, its very capital is named Sofia. The Roman Catholic Church has a redeeming feature, even though for 3,000 years it might be considered one of the longest lasting criminal organizations in the world, the atrocities it's committed, have not always been without purpose. The Crusades were justified in the sense of the threat that Islam presented in its debased and barbaric form after the fall of the ancient Caliph. At that point, the Crusades were necessary to save Europe. There was no concept of Europe in those days. The closest concept that we had was Christendom. There was the negative aspect of it in which much of what the church attacked was the Orthodox Church, which is what they did in World War II through Greater Croatia. Their crimes being so vile that the Nazis were disgusted. But nevertheless, what will redeem the church will be a redeification of Mary, Mariolatry. They have Mary on a par with God himself. But this is where the Eastern Orthodox Church can prove itself 
specifically through Bulgaria, through Sofia. In Carl Jung, and it's important to understand this about Carl Gustav Jung, the original progenitor of our modern concept of psychiatry was Sigmund Freud, who was Jewish. However, Sigmund Freud was obsessed with the degenerate negative aspects of sexuality, uh, fetishes, with everything from fecal matter to uh, just incest, very negative aspects of dysfunction are what characterize Freudian psychiatry. The Nazis wanted an Aryan psychology. Carl Gustav Jung considered himself the Aryan Christ. He was someone who was trying to usher in a generation of mutants in the most positive sense. His psychology was based on symbolism rather than fetishism. He was the Nazi answer to Jewish psychotherapy. And Carl Jung's answer to Job, Jung calls Sophia the logos, the word itself. He named Sophia the mediator between humanity and God. Now, Sophia wasn't something he invented. The ancient Greeks, who were patriarchal to the point of pathology, basically misogynist, would only refer to wisdom as Sophia, always the feminine. She is the feminine wisdom exiled from this world because in Gnostic Christian mythology, she created the world without consent from God. And in doing so, created a false God called the Demiurge and the serpent and the fall. The redemption of the world is the return of Sophia from exile. In his epic work of Christian mysticism, Valentin Tomberg wrote that the complete Holy Trinity is not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In fact, it is the Holy Trinity plus Mother, Daughter, and Holy Soul. The Holy Trinity, according to the greatest master of Catholic mysticism I have ever read, is actually composed of six parts, not three, and it is feminine and masculine in, in nature. It is intersex of both sexes. It is fundamentally androgynous. There's so much we do not yet understand about human identity. Why must traditionalists cut off all possibility for transformation out of fear alone? This is why I had to learn to live with the young child prostitute I adopted off the streets who I had had sex with while she was growing up, who I had intended to marry. I had to come to terms with her gender dysfunction, dysphoria her being unhappy with being physically female, that she had always felt spiritually male. I had to come to terms with that. I wasn't going to spend the rest of my life fucking her up the ass, so I married her off to a wealthy man who could care for him the rest of his life. But I came to understand that to combine the feminine and the masculine is the goal of all this gender trouble, to make one where there is now division. In the answer to Job, Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, refers to Yahweh, or God himself, as unconscious, a monster, a beast of nature. It is only Sophia who is able to create self-reflection through the mediation between Yahweh, Yahweh and Job. It is the feminine out of which the logos, the word, is born. So we need to understand that when it comes to what has happened in the world thus far, the misunderstanding of Christianity itself, without the revelation of the Magi, which should be in the Bible, we have an incomplete Christianity, a perverted Christianity based on Judaism. Something so sick as a concept of Judeo-Christian. What a term. You may as well more readily say Judeo-Islam. They're both Semitic peoples of the desert because Yahweh and Allah are both a war god, a sword god, a moon god, 
a mad god of the desert who calls for the mass murder of entire races. If modern feminism is corrupt, in spite of the positive which I've articulated, it's because of this latter reality that I've just described, because culture itself is corrupt. If the transgender movement, of which my adoptive son is personification of, is incomplete, it is because it is too political and not enough immersed in the archaic foundations for transforming gender, the mythical synthesis of male and female. But we also have ourselves to blame for removing Sophia entirely from our retellings of the biblical story. Sophia is the feminine Christ. Without her, there is only cruel and delusional Yahweh of the Old Testament, the primal God who shaped the world, but who is not fit to run it alone. Because you mentioned the Magi several times during this interview, uh, we would like to continue with the subject of magic itself. You once described magic as a mechanism, sort of a different kind of physics. Can you give us your view on magic? Yes, yes, of course. But definitely some thought to finish here. To continue back to magic, I do want people to understand that uh, you have people out there, these pseudo-philosophers that are confusing young men like Jordan Peterson, who explicitly defined the relationship between male and female as that of Christ and Mary, which is probably a Roman Catholic background that many Canadian men like him have. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, the great philosopher, was Canadian, as was uh, Mr. Chardin. T.L.R. de Chardin was uh, the French-Canadian uh, Roman Catholic that had the concept of the nuosphere the concept of what the New Age would call the Akashic Records, a kind of mass memory or awareness. In other words, what that incomplete Western Christian concept implies is that Mary raises Christ. The purpose of woman is in their, well, the eyes of the West, not to become heroes, but to raise them. Now, that is impossible for a truly ambitious woman. And if I were born a woman obsessed with these mystical and philosophical questions, I would resent that statement so deeply I may never recover. So that philosophy is centered in that way upon a male subject. In order to redeem the father, the next generation of mythical thinkers must reorient the woman out of this secondary position. And perhaps that entails changing the very biology of childbirth with DNA editing. Who knows what will follow? So the transhumanist idea through the Shinto concept of understanding the humanity in all things must return Sophia to this world, not be finished at the half answer of Mary. Uh, Mary Sophia is the ultimate form of woman, both raiser of heroes and the hero herself. That is completeness, perfection. Not this half answer of woman in one quarter, men in another, men striving, woman bearing children. The reason for the fall and the progress of history is to return to Eden with higher values and more complete myths, not merely to repeat the past. But that brings us to magic and changing this reality around us. How does magic work? Spells may be kinds of video game cheat codes, certain instructions that are fed to the operating system of reality that allow rewrites and new instructions. They, of course, are also sorts of sonic keys that, when spoken aloud, change reality on a quantum level. Reality might be best perceived as Maya, illusion. Those bold enough may force their will upon it. Spells are no more than disciplines to more easily part that veil. Enchantments may be seen as a completely rational phenomena that operates outside of scientific research. But of course, you must never forget 
that dark forces attracted to words, gestures, and more importantly, emotion and intent. Hear the spells being cast and change the world to accommodate the will of the caster. So when it comes to the kind of magic that, well, I'm trying to think of harp. How does that fit in? That is evocation as a super science. Of course, evocation may be considered the completion of an equation, the closing of a circuit. When you evoke an entity, you complete that mathematical physics equation. You close that circuit. Harp does that mechanically. Two nodes are created. Still points in space time. Creating a world line the entity can use to navigate to enter our dimension. Topological symbols, such as the famous elder sign, which of course Howard Phillips Lovecraft described in the only novella ever published in his lifetime. He had many short stories published, but never a book. The only book published in his lifetime was The Shadow Over Innsmouth. In there, he describes the Elder Sign as the swastika, the Hockenkreutz, the Hooked Cross. That was the cross that Constantine saw in the sun itself when the voice of God spraketh unto he, under this sign, conquer. That became the Hooked Cross of the Roman legions. That became the ward of the National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiter Party, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, and the Nazis. The ward which holds off the anti-gods. This is what's used at either end of the summoning, creating an area of hostility for the entity to be summoned, then imprisoned like a rat in a trap. Then a charge is created, where once it was necessary to enter gnosis, communion, which would shatter your mind and leave you insane to complete that circuit between the Twa nodes, thus charging them. Alternate power sources can now be used. Most often in the 20th century, this was electricity, but certainly nuclear, geothermic, or any other kind of power can be used to charge spell. The amount of energy used will influence how effective the evocation is, and the amount of power generated for heart is practically infinite. The use of power. Yes. Any examples of how the military applies that magic on the battleground? Yes. Yeah. Understand that um, first. Understand that the. Use of power and the solution of an equation attracts entities. Specific entities react to specific equations, much like the use of a true name, the barbarous name of the anti-god, which no human voice can even mouth. The human vocal cords simply aren't evolved. But so long as a basic circuit of energy is created and successfully closed, no entrance to no cease is required anyway. This is how technology has taken over the field of magic. That's what needs to be understood first, which is how the military of the Americans can deploy it at all. These aren't men willing to die by the thousands like the Japanese to sacrifice themselves to feed the kami and create the kamikaze. These are cowards and fools who use their minds and intellects in the hopes the anti-gods will fight their wars for them. So when it comes to their use upon the battlefield, think of, God, what comes to my mind aside from Iraq? I'm trying not to personalize this because of course I served in Operation Desert Storm where Cthulhu was called upon by Michael Aquino. 
you had the Iraqi army, which had held off the Iranians for eight years. Men who had sacrificed a million lives in what was the World War I of the Middle East. Surrender en masse within hours. None of that is natural. That is supernatural. Think of the damage that was done. When you think upon the horror of what came out of Montauk. I was asked about, of course, what happened in 1963. But our man, Mr. Well, my co-author, Peter Moon, can answer to that with greater detail. I, on the other hand, was born in 1966. And that's when the Montauk monster was unleashed. If you ever see the movie Forbidden Planet, which was produced in the 1960s. You've got this science fiction film with some of the best special effects anyone had ever done up to that time. You've got Robbie the Robot, of course, and Leslie Nielsen, normally a comedian playing a straight role as a captain of a flying saucer exploring the cosmos. But then you've got this monster that murders Earthmen in their sleep, this energy beast, invisible, intangible, with a touch that can melt steel and claws like white hot swords. So the United States Air Force managed to summon something a lot like the Forbidden Planet monstrosity and accidentally let it loose on Long Island on a fall day in 1966, the day that I was born. In a short version of the story, well, despite the hazards identified in the Philadelphia experiment, the government was still interested in exploring some of the possibilities offered by the technology inadvertently discovered during Project Rainbow. So Rainbow was used to signify full spectrum dominance that the Americans were seeking. Full spectrum dominance of every dimension not just ours. So a few years after the end of the war, as Americans understand it, understand that it didn't end until 1952, so the war with Japan was over by then, the Japanese-American peace treaty going into effect on the emperor's birthday as a sign of his victory. But by 1966, and still to today, America is still, along with all the allies, legally at war with the Third Reich in exile. But in the midst of the Cold War, as the Americans called it, because they couldn't legally declare a third world war with the Soviets, a quiet portion of Montauk Air Force radar station was appropriated for a continuity, a continuation of the experiments under more controlled conditions. The SAGE radar was supposedly positioned to watch the skies over the Atlantic for Russian bombers was actually a massive land-based installation designed to duplicate the effects of the equipment installed on board the USS Eldridge back in 1943. Now from 1959 through 1983, experiments in teleportation, dimensional transport, and time travel took place on the eastern end of Long Island, only a few miles from the quaint summer beachfront homes of the Manhattan elite. Some of these experiments breached the dimensional barrier to whatever took place. Well, to whatever place it is that the Evanesers came as from. That's another story. But on at least that occasion of my birthday, something different came through. The Montauk monster was this rampaging force of destruction that angrily lashed out at anything, living or non-living, that happened to fall in its path slashing with its extremities, causing horrible burns. It's, well, it was basically an Evanescer in reverse, just maintaining its existence in normal space 
using up whatever energy it had, outraged that it wasn't embodied in, packaged in a mortal coil to possess that would keep it in a dimension in a stable form. So it was basically enraged, feral, wild. It's uh, thus far, so far as I could see by the records I destroyed, appeared to have been the unique product of an experiment in dimensional physics. There were no other reports of similar creatures existing, but it's possible that any high energy physics experiment might breach the dimensional barriers and open a doorway for a similar being to step through. Fortunately, the monsters can exist in our dimension for only a few short hours before they vanish, never to return. Now, when they tried to theorize about it, everything suggested that the Montauk monster and the Evanesser were the same species perceived in two very different manifestations. Certainly the similarity of the special powers suggested some kind of link, and that forces me to go back to the Philadelphia experiment, which my legal father was a part of. He was a man of much combat experience and was considered, of course, valuable in action in the Pacific. But he had also served in the Mediterranean before the Pacific War began. He was originally a China gunboat sailor. My father had been all over him. Maybe that's why they wanted him to be one of the sailors in support of the program. Now, he wasn't on the USS Eldridge. He was, he was on shore. Now, in the summer of 1943, the nations of the world were engaged in the most titanic conflagration wrought by humankind, the Second World War. And in search for a decisive advantage, scientists on both sides were working feverishly to bring newer and more deadly weapons to the battlefield. And Project Rainbow, full spectrum dominance, was one such program. An attempt to employ the principles set forth in Einstein's incomplete unified field theory to render ships or planes invisible to radar. And that project later became much better known to history as the Philadelphia Experiment. Now, because the eccentric genius Nikola Tesla had killed himself, it was under the direction of John von Neumann, Dr. John von Neumann. The scientists and engineers of Project Rainbow appropriated for their experiments the USS Eldridge. DE-173 was its ship code. This newly constructed destroyer escort, then fitting out at the Philadelphia Naval Yard, and the Eldridge's, well, their gun turrets were removed and replaced with massive generators, and the entire ship was wrapped in magnetic coils. And on October 28, 1943, the Eldridge went to sea for the final operational test of the Rainbow Equipment Installation. At 5.15 p.m., three electricians' mates threw the switches that powered those math of well, those mammoth field coils and a green cloud of mist formed around the Eldridge and the ship grew transparent and moments later it vanished completely in a blinding blue flash. Now to the observers, the command and support ships stationed nearby, like my father was on, the small destroyer was simply gone. Although eyewitnesses at the Norfolk Naval Base almost 200 miles away claimed that the Eldridge appeared out of nowhere and remained for several minutes before vanishing again. But when the Eldridge returned, it was clear that Project Rainbow had far exceeded the expected results of simply rendering a ship invisible and immune to torpedoes in our space-time dimension because it physically wouldn't be here. But by accident or design, American scientists had breached the walls of time and space catapulting the ship hundreds of miles in the blink of an eye. The experiment was deemed a failure because the effects on the crew were extraordinary and horrible. Most men on board, the lucky ones, simply went irrevocably insane, spent the rest of the war confined in a special ward of Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland. Others were burned terribly, both inside and out, in a manner reminiscent of victims of spontaneous human combustion. A few simply vanished from the ship altogether, 
and did not return when the Eldridge came back from wherever it had gone to. Most horrible of all, some men were actually fused into the steel superstructure of the ship when the Eldridge reappeared. Now, the small number of crewmen who survived the experience with mind and body more or less intact didn't escape the effects altogether. These sailors displayed a peculiar tendency to simply fade out of existence weeks or months after the experiment had taken place. Twa men caught in a barroom brawl in Philadelphia vanished into thin air at the sight of a dozen witnesses, never to be seen again. Another man was seen to walk through a wall and vanish. Likewise, never to be seen again. There are, of course, hundreds of men that were living for generations into the 90s or the aughts, the zeros decade of the first decade of this century. But no one aboard that ship on October 28th, 1943 survived, at least not to be sane. The Office of the Naval Research had this nice little form letter called OI-511 that denied any of this ever took place. But it doesn't explain why the Eldridge's own logs from July to December of 1943 are missing. Only I can explain that because I destroyed them. Now, what came back with some of these men, one of whom my father was physically in a fight with, one of those barroom brawls that sailors always get into, because the guy wasn't responding to him, he felt he was being disrespected. This is what you call an Evanescer. It's just basically something that it's not human at all something that's come back with a different kind of power uh but definitely not behaving as a normal human being it's how do i say this the experiment when it took place the way you could describe the results if you were somehow to try and partake in a, well, my father, he was brought in with so many other sailors because he had been a witness. They were basically presented something that was probably produced by L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard was a specialist in psychological warfare. That was how he became so adept at psychology. He was someone who was used to monitor the effects of the atomic bombs on human psychology at Enowetok at Bikini Atoll, where my father had served. So what he presented was the fact that uh, what the Navy got out of the deal that could be considered the most dubious success was that they got a number of Evanescers that came out of the Philadelphia Project. These Evanescers are the Montauk monster, in essence, but it's jacked a human body. So when these Evanescers came on back with the rest of the crew that was fused into the hull or uh, Stark Raven mad or burning alive, these faders look like any other human. They were once human after all. The only real difference between an Evanescer and a human, the sailors called them faders, lies in the mind and the personality. The Evanescer's human persona has been completely compromised or replaced by an alien intellect from some distant reach of space. They don't speak much, 
They're often perceived as sullen, expressionless, apathetic. This is why they enrage a lot of people around them into attacking them. These Evanescers seem to download memories, learning from the people they've replaced. So they're familiar with details of the person's life and society, but they're cold, ruthless, brilliant imitations of the person they used to be. There's one more thing about the Evanescers. They don't age, at least not in the way most people do. Every Evanescer in existence looks exactly like its body did in 1943. It sticks to its cover identity unless threatened with imminent violence or confinement. That means that an Evanescer spends most of its time looking, acting, and reacting like an extremely withdrawn or quietly hostile human being. They don't use two words where one word will do. If confronted by a small number of enemies, the Evanescer may strike back with all its formidable powers seeking to silence them forever. Against overwhelming odds or in difficult situations, the Evanescer simply leaves using its paranormal abilities. When a fader is not protecting its cover identity or trying to fit into human society, it moves quickly and ruthlessly to neutralize opponents in the most efficient manner possible. Uh, a fader breaking into a power plant, uh, well, it simply evanesces, fades past the guards, murders anyone who happens to stumble across it while it's doing its work. Our, an Evanescer decides that a situation is irretrievable and uses his powers to vanish instead of risking capture or incapacitation. They might use human weapons and tactics, but they don't arm themselves unless it fits the cover identity or they don't care who sees them. In a fight, an Evanescer is much more likely to rely on its dimensional warping skills in order to neutralize or escape its foes as quickly as possible. They come to our world through doorways, portals, dimensional gates, or conditions resembling those devices. And whether they meant to or not, the scientists of Project Rainbow stumbled on the means of creating a doorway and managed to send, at best count, 120 human beings into a place where they don't belong. And the way L. Ron Hubbard presented it, and my father was sure it was him that wrote the presentation that was delivered to the sailors who had been involved with the project to warn them to be on the lookout and report if they ever found these men again. What they got back in return were a hundred or so lunatics, 10 or 12 cadavers, and about a half dozen Evanescers, human beings possessed by alien intelligences, driven by two primary motivations. First, they require electromagnetic fields for sustenance. While they're physi physiologically human, they, they alien intelligence that is imprinted over the human mind seems to require electromagnetic energy to stay alive. So they even raid power stations, electrical plants, radar stations, or TV and radio towers in an emergency. But most prefer to establish a cover identity that allows them to access electromagnetic energy on a routine basis. Therefore, Evanescers pose as engineers, linemen, technicians, or scientists. Sometimes Evanescers sell their technical knowledge in the private sector, use their fortunes to create private power plants or stations where they can indulge their hunger at will. If you've got some eccentric millionaire, whose desert retreat includes hundreds of acres of windmill generators. That could be an Evanescer laying low in his stronghold. In fact, some Evanescers, this is why the sailors were given the forewarning to be on the lookout. Well, they were entreated as if they were commie. They work for the government now, exchanging their knowledge of technology for facilities and funds suitable to their work. Some of these individuals were involved with the secret experiments at the Montauk radar station from the mid 50s until the mid 80s, dabbling in teleportation and time travel and broadcast power and other phenomena. You see, no one knows how many Evanescers there are. About six to 10 of the Eldridge's crew and the technicians aboard the ship on the day of the test are currently unaccounted for. The uncertainty stems from the question of exactly how many technicians were even on board when the generators were started. Nobody counted. There may be more Evanescers, especially 
if the rumors about the Air Force's Project Montauk or similar Soviets experiments are true. So understand why this is so important to Peter Moon's story. Peter Moon writes about time travel. At the time of one of the atomic bomb tests where they miscalculated something that he became an alcoholic about because it haunted him the rest of his life. It was a test where they thought the world had ended. Castle Bravo, the largest United States nuclear explosion ever. When Project Castle Bravo was conducted, there was a technical advisor on board that my dad knew he recognized from the USS Aldridge. He felt so outraged, so violated, that at the moment the test was conducted, he lost his mind and attacked this individual, hoping to push him overboard. He was on a carrier. He could have done this. This wasn't like a ship with a guardrail. He found himself unable to move this individual squarely behind him when the bomb exploded, trying to push him off deck. Everybody was too paralyzed by what happened to even notice he had broken ranks. The man he was pushing against just laughed. Turned into, my father swore, solid substance. You couldn't call it metal. Solid, opaque. That's what saved my father. They had miscalculated the power of the bomb. It was orders of magnitude more powerful than they thought. The world exploded. The sky disappeared. They could see space itself. Everyone could see each other's skeletons. Through closed eyelids. Through their closed eyelids, everyone could see the bones in their own hands. My father saw all the other sailors turn into skeletons. But the man in front of him protected him from all the radiation. By the time the sailors became visible again, they all glowed in the dark. Because it was pitch black, the sun had disappeared. All they could see was space. Then it rained black snow all over the Pacific. All the islanders and islands miles away melted alive. The sailors at the center of the test were like in the center of a storm, the eye of the storm, protected from that effect. The majority of them would die of cancer. All of them technically survived, but not really. Sterilized. Burns, equivalent to days in the sun. Flesh peeling off in chunks. But that sheer opaque wall of something that my father was pushing against reformed into a man again turned back to look at him and laugh and walk away but my dad was the only sailor able to help the others they thought he was somehow superhuman not realizing he'd been protected by an evanescent my father described that man, and he matches the physical description of Dr. David Lewis Anderson, hmm. the man who invented time travel for the United States, the man Peter Moon met several times. 
We never eat in front of Peter Moon. Married a woman he doesn't live with. Just to maintain the cover of humanity. Dr. David Lewis Anderson wound up working at Kodak. Kodak was gone. The Japanese had produced technology that rendered Kodak technology worthless. Kodak was an abandoned factory town, a ghost town. But they had an enormous power station. Because of his defense contracts, David Lewis Anderson moved in all by himself in an empty industrial site with its own hospital, abandoned amusement park for the kids, abandoned schools, and a power station that could have kept them all running, all feeding David Lewis Anderson. Chemical vats large enough to melt bodies in. Him living there all by himself for years. Feeding off the energy. Giving tidbits of his knowledge of metaphysics to the U.S. government. That is a very interesting take on these events. Your dates seems to differ from the original legend, but I guess uh, they're coming from the Presidio's archives. That and my father, yeah. but uh, certainly the dates uh, from the Presidio archives fit into, from my narrative, my understanding of what was put together by what I saw and what my father told me. My legal father, of course, the man who raised and guided me. Was Aquino aware of what was happening in, at Montauk? Yes, he considered Dr. David Lewis Anderson a great rival for black budget finances, for monetary resources. They were working on different projects. And uh, so he first made me aware of Dr. David Lewis Anderson's work with light cones. And uh, this is something that... Um, is uh, how I first became aware of Dr. David Lewis Anderson. And when I brought up the name with my father, then showed him some images is when my father identified him as the man who was at Project Castle Bravo. And the man he had earlier seen at the Philadelphia Experiment. That Dr. David Lewis Anderson's knowledge is not that of a human being. That he's an Evanescer. A creature feeds off energy. People might ask, why don't they just take over the world? What would be the point? They're just here to feed. Uh, it's not in their agenda to administer, but to parasitize. What so, was Peter Moon's reactions to this? Peter Moon can't deny it. He says uh, that he eats simply something that he feels that he has an affinity for Dr. David Lewis Anderson, but he understands he can't deny anything I say. He saw Dr. David Lewis Anderson, you're talking about a scientist who is a major physicist. He saw him in a kickbox fight where he said, Dr. David Lewis Anderson, was getting the beat down, but then turned around and kicked the guy's ass, this professional master of kickboxing, no less. This is the stuff that happens only in movies. It's so cinematic, it's not even believable. Your average person is getting beaten in a fight. The ability to recoup and recover yourself and then to persevere and prevail is, that's cinematic. It's almost impossible. It happens once in a while with true warriors, but we're talking about nuclear physicists <laughs> that can do that. That's a bit superhuman. Yeah. So Peter Moon's not able to deny what I'm saying. And when Peter Moon was with him and he had all his food, Dr. David Lewis Anderson just said, eat, eat. And Peter's going, aren't you hungry? Don't you want some? No, no, I, I don't eat food. 
and you're telling me this guy is human? Please. I I also met him, by the way. I don't know if you were. And what was your impression? Alienated. I I was uh, with a psychic friend, yeah. which was actually friends of Peter's. Yeah. And she said that um, she's seeing like a Delta T antenna construction above his head. Okay. Yeah. Thank but you. he vis he visited me and my friend in Bulgaria for a day, yes. which was strange. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, he appears at the damnedest places. And yeah. as you know, he's he's been in Central Europe. He's been in Bulgaria, Romania. He mm -hmm. gets around. Um, he is someone who uh, I think uh, at some point um, he Peter Moon was 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 just put it this way. It's it's one of these things where he's been a profound influence in Peter Moon's life. He may have been not so much influential in your life, but your meeting him is exceptional. Yeah, it's consider yourself to, I don't know if I'd call it a privilege or a blessing, but <laughs> uh, consider yourself, it's it's certainly a rare experience. Uh, I treated him a Fanta. <laughs> what was that? I treated him a Fanta. Okay. Yes, a Fanta, Fanta Lima. Yes. <laughs> he was uh, enjoying it. That's good. That's, that's there you go. So that's it. So he drank something in front of you, and yeah, uh, yeah. that's not impossible, of course. It's uh, but that's that's interesting. The Fanta, of course, by the way, was developed by the Nazis, so that's that's actually yeah. quite ironic. Um, <laughs> so when, when it comes to the magic in warfare, I've described the kamikaze, the other was at uh, well, at the uh, as I said, Operation Desert Storm, where the Iraqi army. If you ever take a look at the damage that was done to the uh, to the Iraqi columns, what they called the highway of death, uh, entire military mechanized columns just devastated. You could take a look at all the air power of the Americans and the battleship offshore and all of this was immense. There was still more to it than that. That's not what gets an army to break that's been through eight years of war. I'm not sure I understood how was that how was that damage done? The, well, the damage was done a lot by American technology, air power, and the battleship offshore, and drones guiding the missile strikes. Um, he, much of it can be explained quite quite logically. The supernatural aspect comes with the break of the army's morale. The fact that so many of them surrendered without a fight, because when they fought back, they beat the Americans. Uh, the spoiler attack at Al Kafia uh, devastated the American Marine Corps. Uh, so you're talking about it's not like the Iraqis couldn't fight back when they weren't affected by the supernatural elements of the American assault. Michael Aquino's raising of the anti God. This is why when I was in Operation Desert Storm and was taking all these surrenders, like all the American Marines and Army were. You couldn't even call these prisoners. They were just like, just like frightened children. None of the Americans spoke Arabic or in those days, it was still nobody knew in any general popular sense, nobody knew H.P. Lovecraft. It wasn't until after the 80s that people began to know about him in a more popular sense where he entered gaming communities and all that, because basically what had happened was Arkham House, which was run by the Edomite cult under the, the cultist that ran it. Uh, the man whose name, I hate him so much, I bleached his name out of my mind. Uh, I'd have to look him up, but uh, in terms of uh, Arkham House, their owner had basically stolen all of Lovecraft's work uh, Lovecraft had never willed anything to Arkham House, uh, which was simply created uh, in South City by August Derleth. I mean, his name comes back to me as in this flash of sickness. It makes me want to puke. But August Derleth had never met H.P. Lovecraft in his entire goddamn life. And August Derleth just came out of nowhere and said, I own all of H.P. Lovecraft's work. And nobody did anything about it. And he stole everything and kept it 
under copyright, lock and key forever for years. Not only reprinting it as misprints by altering the text completely and stealing Lovecraft's work or writing his own work and claiming it was Lovecraft's just to make it sell. That son of a bitch pretty much made sure nobody heard of H.P. Lovecraft outside of occult circles. So at that time, just when Lovecraft was becoming to enter the popular culture, but was still very much only on the minds of teenage gamers or role, role game players or the like, role-playing gamers, uh, we didn't even have the computers back then for video gaming to the degree that we do now. So the closest thing, you didn't even have Cthulhu in video games at the, at the time of Desert Storm in any great degree other than something similar to an octopus type of Pong or something. Uh, I don't think they ever used his name until the, after the Gulf War. But the prisoners that were coming in were all saying, Al Cthulhu, Al Cthulhu. And the Americans would just shake their heads and not know what the fuck was talking about, and they didn't care. So many of them had seen Cthulhu. They described it to me as I described him to you. al Shaitan is Cthulhu, reciting the verse from the Quran. So did Aquino invoke him? Very much so. Yeah. That was what defeated the Iraqi army, sent all the men running, demoralized them. That was, uh, yeah. that was how the Gulf War was won. It was, and, yeah, go on. And of course, the, the anti-gods and H.P. Lovecraft are a huge topic, which we would like to discuss in our further episode. But Absolutely. Uh, for a final now, um, bring our attention to our geographical locale. Yes, uh, yes uh, you, could, you could understand that uh, we have uh, some personal interest, interest in any view or secret information you might have uh, concerning Bulgaria. Uh, could you give us anything at all in that direction, please? What I can tell you is that the occult nature of Bulgaria is such that with all the intelligence that was amassed, uh, from behind the Iron Curtain by the Americans. There was, I think, the most decisive or important thing that stuck with me all these years has been what I relayed about the Bulgarian treatment administered by Dr. Morel to Adolf Hitler, my biological father. I think that beyond that, what I need to emphasize to our Bulgarian listeners is that they must understand that in a very real sense, the future of the world lies with them because they're in the middle of everything. They're the crossroads between the resurgent and very aggressive Turkish Empire, the Black Sea, and the West. It's the future of the world in many ways will be decided in Bulgaria, and the Bulgarian people need to realize how important everything they do is, that they have to make the right decisions and that they have to understand that they need to mobilize in a cohesive cultural identity, that they once had a czar of their own and that this renders them one of the only nations in the world to have a czar besides Russia and Serbia. So, honestly, they are one of the bulwarks of civilization itself. The, one of the heirs to the Roman Empire. Uh, whatever decisions they make, whatever direction or path they choose affects the rest of us. And as so few of us remain, as the populations decline everywhere from Japan to China to Russia to... Uh, anywhere in the developed world, they have to understand that they need to start reproducing 
and um, if any of us are to have a future. And I would admonish, of course, all the developed world's nations in that regard. But in Bulgaria, you're holding a line. You're holding a front line. And we don't want to get what? political with it, but I think people understand the spiritual importance of what I've just said. Why do you think this area is so, is so pivotal? Is it uh, only because it's, it's a crossroad? There is that. But beyond that, the Bulgars are descendants of a kind of Slavdom that was once present in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina. They are part of an ancient Bulgar lineage of Slavs that is exceptional and unique. Something affiliated back to the original homeland of uh, or heartland that created the Alexandrian Empire. Alexander, of course, was Macedonian, not Greek. And for those who do not know, Macedonia was claimed by the Bulgarians and Adolf Hitler acknowledged and recognized Bulgarian occupation of Macedonia in World War II. This was something that uh, is important to remember because this provided the Bulgarians an outlet into the Aegean Sea. This was also something that was pivotal to the original Alexander. People need to understand that the great leaders in the world who have changed world history have to be cosmopolitan. They cannot be regional and and what we would call, uh, oh God, provincial. They need to have a worldly identity. This is why Alexander the Great was not Greek. He was Macedonian. Adolf Hitler was not German. He was Austrian. Napoleon Bonaparte was not French. He was Corsican. Joseph Stalin was not Russian. He was Georgian. Georgian. When it comes to Alexander the Great, you're talking about someone who can readily be identified with Bulgaria. This is a man who went on to conquer the known world at the age of 24. He is very dear to me because I am what I call cosmogenic, obviously a hybrid between Asia and Europe. I am a product of both the Caucasoid and Asiatic bloodlines. Alexander the Great held the largest wedding in human history. He called it the marriage of East and West, in which each soldier in his army took a Persian bride. He himself converted to Buddhism. Had he not been assassinated, the Hellenic world would have been a Buddhist world, more aligned to what I've described about Asia and Shinto. What needs to happen is an identification with what Bulgaria is capable of. When I spoke of the Sofia, the very capital city in Bulgaria, which takes her name, understand that the Russian Empire has been active in Syria for many years. What Bulgaria needs to do is culturally extend itself as they did under Alexander. Imagine instead of a papacy in Rome, which is indicative of patriarchy, a universal mammacy, a mammal or female papacy in, well, New Babylon, a reconstructed Baghdad. Bulgaria could be part of a project like that. Instead of Russian military intervention, a kind of Sophian intervention in that area of the world would be along the lines of what Alexander envisioned with his idea of a Buddhist Europe. This is something that uh, would usher in a new age, truly a new age.
more matriarchal or matrilineal, something that would really help mankind evolve. This is uh, something the Bulgarians can do if they begin to lead the world by allowing, well, the woman to lead. It would maybe be an improvement from their current electoral cycle, but I won't go deeper than that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why America always wanted uh, divided Balkans? This is why America has done its best to destroy the Balkans. It, uh, it did its best when it launched a supermassive bombing raid into Romania. It uh, did its best when it used NATO to basically break its, its own mission statement, which was a defensive organization to stand against Russian invasion, and they instead attacked Serbia. This was a violation of NATO ordinance and its own reasons for existence. Uh, it's raison d'etre. The uh, Americans at that point rendered... NATO in its own way, an illegitimate organization, just as the United Nations was rendered illegitimate by its involvement in human slavery in Africa that I encountered. I think that uh, people need to understand that all the Balkans have never been united because it's been in everyone's interest to divide them, or render them impotent by uh, stirring hatred against each other. I think, of course, that uh, obviously uh, that entire region from the Baltic to the Black Sea is what geopoliticians call a shatterbelt region, meaning many cultures are here. We'll go into that next episode because much of this was fragmented, fractured by the Jewish pale of settlement. Uh, this is something that... Uh, help to stifle, stymie, or, or retard the growth of these cultures for many centuries. Uh, the cultures, of course, were shattered by the invasion of the Mongols. It's what led to the division uh, culturally of Eastern and Western Europe was those that were conquered by the Mongols and, and those that were essentially saved by Japan destroying the Mongols at the other end of the world. So when it comes to all that the Eastern Europeans have suffered, and I count the East Germans among them, uh, the, they are still the only real hope for the salvation of Central Europe, because even though there may be a demographic disaster, they are still culturally more intact. There's challenges to that. Uh, Bulgaria is certainly on the front line of that. Uh, but this is why there has to be a rally around cultural identity. When you speak of secret societies, there's a, another Freemason who had an enormous uh, influence on uh, so much of the world. Uh, an individual who uh, basically changed the world, who was half Japanese and half Austrian as I am half Austrian biologically and a fourth Japanese and a fourth Chinese. I too am a child of nobility from my mother's side. This man was a child of nobility from his father's side, Richard Kodenhove Carlegi, the Kudenhove of Austria, Hungary. And he was really born Nicolas Aijiro, from his Japanese mother's uh, name. And Richard Nicolas Aijiro became the Count of Udenhov Kalergi. He was the man who pushed for a pan Europe, but he was predicting a blending of races. I understand that in America, this is much more necessary. In America, you have so many races extant that in certain areas, the major cities, they need to be safe. Well, safe zones for people like me, cosmogenates, what they used to call miscegenates. 
hybrid peoples or mixed race peoples. My point, mixed to the extent where I have a different species within me of humanity, not just, not just different racially, but in terms of human species. When it came to Richard Kudenhoff Carnegie, Adolf Hitler, my biological father, called him a cosmopolitan bastard because he was essentially trying to deconstruct the cultural identities of Europe. You could consider me an anti kalegi someone who is trying to preserve the cultural identities of Europe while demanding that certainly large zones of the United States become safe zones for hybrid people like myself. If people begin to interbreed in Europe, those products of interbreeding are welcome here in the United States. They don't belong in Europe. Europe needs to be considered a kind of regional safe zone for Caucasian man and woman. Just as the Asians and black Africans maintain an ethnic homogeneity, any attempt to outbreed the European races is nothing less than genocide. That needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be fought. It's what my father fought against. He believed in a superiority of all races in their own Lebensraum, our living space. This is something that needs to be communicated to the postmodern world. Whereas the Kalargi plan has resulted in so much damage to Europe, understand that I am my father's son and fight against what he has wrought. And that is something which I call on all Europeans to rally. Rally to, rally with, rally for. The human future depends upon it. Thank you for this call to unity, Douglas. Uh, for last question, could you please uh, tell us what do you think uh, of the role of Eastern Orthodoxy and Muk also told me that you have had some involvement with the Serbian branch of it. Yes, it's uh, this is what happened was when I served as a mercenary in the Balkans. I was employed by the Prince and Princess of Yugoslavia. Now, naturally, they would deny this, but there's enough witnesses around that would reinforce what I'm saying. It's not something that I have a need for people to believe it's simply something that well they have to come to terms with if they want to understand my narrative what happened was the prince and princes of yugoslavia were never coronated as king or queen but they still exist they live in england london of course uh in fact the prince of yugoslavia was born there uh when the yugoslavian monarchy uh escaped during world war ii uh, when the, um, when it came to the Kaiser of Germany, even, uh, they still exist as a royal family. They're simply not coronated and therefore they exist as a kind of royalty in exile or, um, in both these places, whether Serbia or Germany, they need to reinstitute a constitutional monarchy it's just for cultural identity. And when it comes to the prince and princess of Yugoslavia, they were, of course, heirs to King Alexander Karadjordjevic's first Yugoslavia, and they would identify more with that, but they should be satisfied simply to come home to a constitutional Serbia that would welcome them, one would hope, in the future. When I worked for them at the time of the Bosnian conflict, they could not abide by a non Christian. Uh, in their service, and I told them I had never been baptized a Roman Catholic, something my father, who was a Roman Catholic, again, very similar to Hudenhov Kalergi, whose father was Catholic, and when his mother married that man, she converted to Catholicism, which is what my mother did when she married my father. And when uh, uh, I had told uh, the prince and princess of Yugoslavia my father had been so uh, understanding. He wanted me to make the choice for myself, so I had never been baptized at birth. 
then I was baptized on the spot as a Serbian Orthodox Christian. Now, <laughs> I've never really attended church very much, but <laughs> formally, yes, I'm Serbian Orthodox Christian. Uh, but you met an angel. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's it's an incredible life story. I mean, one thing that I've always told people about having experienced a life that was an endless sea of horrors is I'm never short of a story to tell. But when it comes to the um, being a Serbian Orthodox Christian, I do think that um, certainly Nikola Tesla needs to be recognized as a saint by the Orthodox Church. He was, of course, someone who was very cosmopolitan himself, and his cross-cultural cross reference was he identified uh, both Croatia and Serbia as his fatherlands, He, or rather Croatia as his fatherland and Serbia as his motherland. So he was someone who would have hated to see the fact that they uh, came to war with each other on such hostile terms. He would have probably been more a uh, Yugoslav. Of course, for American listeners to understand, if any Westerners uh, are listening, try to understand that Yugoslavia simply means South Slav. And the King Kara Georgievich once tried to get Bulgaria to unite with Yugoslavia. So it technically integrates the Macedonians and the Bulgarians as well. But um, it's something that the Bulgarians wanted to retain their identity and it was probably for the best. And I think that that should be the way that we work with this in the future. Certainly, the one thing that I do want to explain to people is that the um, the Orthodox churches are probably in great need of a kind of reformation, just as the Roman Catholic Church has become very fossilized, very ossified, and corrupt. This is what I try to tell people. It's like being a police force. Any police force that tries to police in a highly corrupt area has to develop relationships with the underworld. You wind up dealing with informants in order to enforce the law at all. This means you also have to have undercover agents, and undercover agents then become involved with criminal organizations. Uh, effectively, they commit crimes while on duty as police officers. The lines become very gray, very blurred. So people need to understand that a church as old as the Roman Catholic Church becomes corrupted because of its exposure to so much of the exorcism, the demonolatry and diabology that then impacts the enforcers of the doctrine, the word of God. This is how churches become corrupted. The way that the Roman Catholic Church can save itself would be towards allowing women to become priests, allowing nuns more power, and ultimately, uh, this could lead to a reformation of a sort that would certainly lessen the cases of child abuse. The Eastern Orthodox Church has been very fortunate in that it has not suffered such scandal, but it still is very much a church that is very fossilized in many ways. <laughs> it has a, a kind of, it's important that it retain a sense of identity and this is why many people were angry that the Roman Catholic Church gave up the Latin liturgy. The Slavonic churches still retain their uh, Slavonic liturgy. All of this is very important. Um, at the same time, I truly believe that uh, the idea of integrating Sophia openly into the church would lead to a kind of reformation that would make it much more identifiable with the entire population in the postmodern age. This would, uh, this would uh, render it something that doesn't look like something out of the Middle Ages. It would render it the hope of the future. As I said, Bulgaria with its own capital taking the name of wisdom herself, this would be a natural point for a orthodox revolution in a kind of Sophionic renaissance a reformation of a sort that would then inspire the other churches, uh, attract younger generations in a, this is, Europe once identified itself only as Christendom. This would lead to a new Christendom. That would be my hope for the future.
That's a great point to conclude. That was, that was absolutely mind blowing. We thank you for your service to mankind and we'll catch up very soon with more show. God bless you and thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. I will stop recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, let me see if I can find the button after all this time and uh,